Peter Schuyler was the Nature Conservancy Santa Cruz Island Preserve Director from 1980 to 1989, where he led sheep eradication and cattle removal and the Catalina Island Conservancy's Director of Ecological Restoration from 1997 to 2004, where he achieved goat and pig eradication on the most populous Channel Island. Peter is a guy who can do just about anything. He can build a steel fence on a 45 degree slope, he can sail across the globe, he can write management plans, court donors, or recite whole Monty Python skits. I'm not doing that today. <laughs> That's later. He'll tell us about the complexities of his conservation efforts and the subsequent recovery. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's an honor to be receiving the Pritzloff Award. Thank you, Botanic Garden. It's also an honor to be receiving it with Luciana and Federico and Kate, so that's, that's also very welcome. Thank you. What I'd like to do today is talk about a few more programs, echoing many of the themes that Kate said, but talking about the removal of animals from Catalina Island and Santa Cruz Island, and some of the lessons we learned. This title was done a little bit before the talk was done, so I'm also gonna add in some of the lessons learned, how we actually did it, as well as some of the opportunities that came up. So back in 1949, Otto Leopold said to keep every cog and wheel as the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. That's morphed a little bit into the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to keep all the pieces. And I think, you know, when you look at a, nat a, nat a natural area with land management as um, needs, you want to save all the native species. I think we can also make a corollary, though, that when you're removing a species from a native ecosystem, you want to do it intelligently also. So the first rule of intelligent subtraction is to reduce the unintended consequences through thoughtful and deliberate actions. And then you also want to open up those opportunities for continued ecosystem restoration. Try to think ahead and think, okay, what can I do after this? And what's first and what's second? I'm going to talk about the removal of feral sheep from Santa Cruz Island. And this is only from 90% of the island because at that time the Park Service did not have ownership of the eastern 10%, so we just worked on the, the western 90%. Removal of cattle from Santa Cruz Island, again from the 90%, and this was a mostly domestic herd, although there was a, a small contingent of feral animals in one of the canyons. And then also removal of feral goats and feral pigs from Santa Catalina Island. As others, Denise and Kate and everybody has said, it's important to remember that we stand on the shoulders of the earlier leaders and the land managers. We're not in this alone. We've learned a lot from them, and we owe it to them and the future conservationists and the general public to explain why we're doing all of this work, that we pass the lessons on that we learned. We're all in this together. It's a small group of people when you look at it sort of in the big scheme of things that actually do, does this kind of work. The resources are not widely available sometimes. And it's also tough work, it's not easy work. And, and so we, keeping the data and the results under wraps doesn't serve anybody. So it's, it's really important that we get the word out there. I think we've done a fairly good job, both in terms of the lessons that we learned, how we did things, then also some of the results of the programs that occurred, you know, both in terms of the results on individual rare species or vegetation communities on animal species. But it is, as I said, really important to get that word out there. The results also need to be viewed through the lens of time. You know, as much as I hate to admit it, people and things and experiences do change. <laughs> so. And the knowledge and the experience that was available in the past can be very different than what we know now. And so we have to learn from the past, both the success, successes and the failures. And it's also, I think, interesting to look at the technology and the restoration practices that were often very rudimentary back in, quote, the old days and compare them to today's resources. And so even as we learn from the past, we have to be open to new opportunities. So it's kind of, you know, how do you find that balance of, okay, take the lessons from the past, but don't think they're necessarily set in concrete, but adapt them and, and move forward. So removal from, of, share, of feral sheep from Santa Cruz when the Conservancy assumes the management opportunities or management responsibilities back in the late 1970s, one of their first questions was, you know, what cha challenge should they really focus on? And it quickly became pretty clear, particularly with the help for a lot of people in this, you know, in this audience and on Zoom today, that the feral sheep was what was really needed to be addressed first if there was going to be a road to recovery for Santa Cruz. The problems of the feral pigs or the, the problems that some of the invasive non-native plants posed sort of pale in contrast to the effects of the sheep. And it wasn't just a few sheep. We were talking about tens of thousands of sheep. 
They range from sea level, you can find them down on the beach, eating what looked like the kelp, <laughs> to the top of the mountain. So they were everywhere on the island. Harold Heady, who was a re well-respected rangeland professor, said that the island had some of the worst overgrazing in Western North America. If you look at these pictures, I don't think you can say that that's not true. <laughs> There's not much growing there that was in, within reach of a sheep's mouth. Then a report from the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden summed it up fairly succinctly and just said, you know, the sheep have to be eliminated now to ensure the survival of rare plants and habitats. The, the island was at a turning point. You know, if, if you left it for too long, you could not do anything into the future. So that was the first challenge the Conservancy faced. So the removal of the sheep would open up new opportunities to, for future restoration projects, and it would also allow the monitoring of, you know, the species and processes that were kind of hidden from view when the sheep were there, and they, you know, the overwhelming impact of the sheep almost, you know, obscured what else was going on. So once the sheep were removed, you could actually figure out what were the next restoration projects. And it was also premature to consider some of those projects while the sheep were still there. So the size and the scale of this project of removing sheep from Santa Cruz was one of the largest to date. It's obviously a rugged island. It goes from zero to 24, over 2,400 feet, 85 square miles, none of it flat, or virtually none of it flat. So the first thing to do, of course, is to make a plan. So you haul out your tr trusty typewriter and crank out a, a two-page outline of how do you get rid of sheep on Santa Cruz Island. <laughs> so that's what this is. It's, it was a whole two-page outline of all the things that needed to be done before you could take the program into effect. First thing, of course, was documentation. So we looked at the sheep, the status of the sheep. Dirk Van Vuren from UC Davis did a very really thorough report of where they were, what they ate, densities, and some management alternatives. We also looked at the impacts of the sheep on rare species, on vegetation communities, on also on the vertebrates of the island. Linda Lauren, who's the reserve manager for UC, um, UCSB out there, did a study for us. We also looked at some of the other processes. You know, what effect were the sheep having on the soils, on erosion, because that, well, that was a considerable um, impact. It turns out this was really fortuitous. I don't think we had quite as many lawsuits as Kate had, but. Um, in 1984, a lawsuit requesting a restraining order to halt the remov removal program was filed. What's a little bit interesting is this wasn't objecting to the fact that we were removing the animals. It was filed because we were ruining the finest recreational sport hunting in North America. <laughs> so it was filed by a wildlife federation. Um, it turns out that the studies that we had done were instrumental in having the case dismissed before it went even to court because the judge looked at it and said, you know, if halting the program would cause extensive and irreversible damage, and so the court never, I mean, the case never even made it to court. So it really pays to be prepared, to do your homework first. And also, these studies also gave us a chance to sort of give us a glimpse into the future, you know, and highlight areas of potential concern and opportunities that might follow the removal of feral sheep. You know, we expected that maybe the pig population would increase in size that fire might become an issue on the island when the vegetation came back. And also problems with invasive plants might spread once these were gone. So it just gave us a little glimpse and the opportunity to start thinking about some of these things. And you'll hear about where those projects have gone from other folks later today. It was a different era in terms of technology and resources. And I think it's just kind of interesting to see where we've come over the years. The accommodations we have, you know, were simple yet functional. There was no GPS. We used hand maps and a compass in the field. <laughs> there were no desktop computers. Nature Conservancy office didn't even have a computer in it when we started working there. No field things, no field um, you know, laptops or anything you could take into the field. So all the information, you know, location information, had to be entered by hand at big, large-scale maps at night. Handwritten notes, typewriters in the office. Even the handheld radios in the beginning of this program were, were kind of uh, obsolete. We used CB radios that were big and bulky, and they worked. And you, as long as you had line of sight, you couldn't really um, talk to the mainland with them. But with, due to a quirk of the atmospheric radio waves, it was really interesting. We could often hear truckers in Georgia and Alabama talking about the speed traps that the police had set up down the road. <laughs> well, we couldn't talk to somebody across the canyon. <laughs> so. By the end, we did get a good system of radios and then, you know, adapted and moved on with that. We did have infrequent, irregular mainland communication. So basically, when we were on the island, we were on our own. It was direct line of sight by radios, and, you, you know, somebody had to be on the other end to receive the radio mission, um, radio transmission, and you had to either be on the coast or up in the top of the mountains. 
There was no internet, widespread internet at the time. So that was both a blessing and a curse. Um, you can't get information as readily as you can today, but at the same time, you don't become a social media story. And I think a good example of that was, you know, we've been doing the program for four years, and then in August of 1984, we hit the big national news. So we had helicopters flying all over the island, trying to take pictures and everything else. It was not on the internet, because there was none. And then a week later, the 1984 Olympics opened in Los Angeles, and we became an old story. <laughs> so really lucky on that one. But in you know, looking at programs since that time in Hawaii, other places around here, once you hit the social media, that story stays out there forever. So. So the lesson that we've sort of learned from the technology and resources is use what you have. You know, and don't wait for every last piece to fall into place. Because if you wait for everything to say, well, we need this or we need that, you're never going to get started. So just go ahead and start. Be deliberate. Be thoughtful. Know what your shortcomings are, but, but go ahead and move. And then when opportunities come, you know, adapt and take advantage of them. One of the things we really wanted to do was document the results that happened after we removed the sheep. And so we wanted to make it both, you know, the specific studies where you look at a rare plant and say, okay, this population has come back and this one is, you know, doing really well in terms of communities. But we also wanted to have a, a much sort of broader look at it. So we set up a series of photo points, which are the red dots on this map of the island, where we actually took photos before we even removed a single animal. And then it followed them through the years. For a while it was every quarter, and then it was every couple years. Now we do it every five years. We actually have a date set up, thanks to John, uh, to go out um, later this spring and, and we do all the photo points there. But what we also wanted to do was make it easy for that program to continue throughout changes in staff, throughout changes in technology. So each photo point had a, a, its own separate sheet where we would say what, where it was, how to refine it, what we were shooting, what the purpose was, how many pictures were taken, and things like that. And, you know, technology has changed. We started out with slides, and we went to digital. You know, and pretty soon, hopefully, you just point an iPhone or an iPad at it, and it'll figure out all the, everything for you right there. <laughs> this program has been going since 1981 through the present, so it's a nice long history. And what it does show you is some of the results. You know, from the period of 1978, which is when the study started, to 1989, over 36,000 sheep were removed. And if you look at some of these pictures, you can go from the, the ones on the top uh, right, no, left. <laughs> um, it was bare rock, no soil, and it's a thriving pine forest came back. You know, far exceeded anything we could possibly have imagined. The bottom left is uh, coastal sage. If you look at that little fence post in the corner and then sort of in the middle, that's the same fence post, but you know, it's almost lost in the re recovery of the Artemisia. Same with grasslands. What I really like about this uh, series on the right is if you look at that top hill where there's extensive erosion, virtually no, no uh, trees or vegetation, it became a 30 to 40 foot tall pine forest. But what's happened since then is because we've been continuing the documentation is that due to the stress of drought and rust and a few other pressures on the thing, that forest has started to decline. So we've actually been able to capture the decline, the recovery, and now a subsequent decline. And when you show somebody a picture like this, it's pretty easy to, to just let the pictures do the talking. Lessons learned, in addition to, to Kate's people, persistence in, in um, partnerships is preparation, adaptability, and, and particularly passion. You have to have a passion for getting this work done. The opportunities that this program provided were to document the recovery of an ecosystem following the removal of a, a very large threat. It allowed the pig program to move forward in subsequent years. Rare plant introductions, you know, in, when the sheep were there, there's no point in putting out rare plants because they just get eaten. Invasive plant control programs could take place. Fire started to happen. Prescribed burns happened on the island. There are some novel unforeseen restoration projects, such as the control of Argentine ants that's going to be mentioned later, I think. So, the removal of cattle from Santa Cruz Island was a whole different sort of project. In late 1987, after the passing of Dr. Kerry Stanton, who was the landowner on the island, the Nature Conservancy unexpectedly, like overnight, found itself in the cattle management business. This was a largely you know, managed herd, but there was a group of about 50 feral cattle that were down in Laguna Canyon, so it added a little bit of a complication. And the Conservancy didn't really have the skills or the experience and, nor the desire to be managing a, a several thousand um, head of cattle. 
but we knew we didn't want it to main, be left unmanaged and get into an area like this where it's overgrazed out to the west end in the late 60s. So in 1988, when the offer opportunity came to remove the entire herd in one fell swoop, so to speak, the Conservancy jumped at it. So in 1989, we removed over 2,000 head of cattle. They were all rounded up, primarily by horseback. You know, although a lot of times it was pushing them by foot too when you went up some of the trails and roads. They all had to go down to Prisoner's Harbor and they were held in the corrals down there. Because it turns out, because we were going from an island to the mainland, we also had to test each and every individual for bovine tuberculosis before the state would allow us to ship them off. So that meant we had to test them, then hold them for a week, get the test results, and then wait for the boat to come. So of course that meant we had to feed them. So we were fortunate because we did, had no resources to really feed them out there. We didn't want to turn them loose. But Dr. Stanton and Henry Duffield, his ranch manager, had stockpiled a, a huge pile of hay in the lower winery building. And so we were able to move all of that hay down to prisoners, feed the cattle for umpteen weeks. They probably didn't think it was the, the finest gourmet hay there was, but they survived. And then we were able to just ship them off. Not all the animals were we able to do on, you know, let them do the walking. Some of the young ones, particularly if it was 10 or 15 miles away, were too small to, to make that trek. So we ended up actually roping them and putting a, a truckload of young heifers in the back and hauling them down that way. And then the feral cattle presented its own challenges. We tried to round them up and move them out on foot several times. They had nothing, wanted nothing to do with that. So we ended up having to uh, rope and tie and bring each you know, animal down individually in the back of a truck. <laughs> so all the animals were shipped off the island on the Vaquero 2, which was Santa Rosa Island's cattle boat. Santa Rosa Cruz Island had access to it and used it. So they all left that way. One little interesting anecdote was that Fred, who was sort of the pet cattle that was around the ranch area, and he was a Texas Longhorn, remained on the island because his horns were too big, so he couldn't fit down the cattle chute. <laughs> so, so, uh, we also left a small herd of about 10 or 12 uh, yearlings just to sort of make the transition from the ranching area to the, to the resource area. We did end up shipping off most of the horses just because we knew that that trip of the Vaquero, that was going to be his last trip. Conservancy didn't want to really be in the horse management business either, so a few horses were left for staff to use, but otherwise they were left, they were taken off the island too. But I think one of the, the lessons we really learned from cattle was you got to really think about the unintended consequences. The release from grazing was something that we thought, oh yeah, there might be some release from grazing, but we didn't expect it to the degree it happened. <laughs> so when the cattle were gone, and we knew fennel was on the island, we knew where it was located somewhat, but we didn't really think about how widespread it was or what might happen. So after cattle and probably the sheep too came off, fennel exploded. You know, it was acres and acres of it. It was taller than the vehicles, taller than the Jeeps. Um, and it's a continuing problem for Nature Conservancy today. They've you know, been doing a number of trials and a number of programs, but it's not a, a solved program, a solved problem, yeah. But it does really make you think that, you know, that first, before you do something, before you take an action, really try to figure out what might happen. But then that sort of gets back to the thing of, okay, we don't want to be in the cattle business. We don't want to be managing 2,000 head. We have an opportunity to ship them all off. We might not know all the consequences. So how do you balance that you know, expediency versus some of the unknown things? Is something that you want to really consider. Jumping down a little bit to Catalina Island. This was a, a program to remove the pigs. It was done in a whole different sort of philosophy. It was done in a phased approach. One thing to remember for Catalina is that we had a population of maybe 4,000 plus permanent residents and over a million visitors per year. So that added to the challenge a bit. The idea was to see what worked and then move on from there. So moving to the uninhabited, most uninhabited area first, there's just a reduction in animals. Then it's like, well, let's try to reduce the animals on the whole island. Let's get rid of them completely on one part of the island and go from there. And then finally, remove all the island. I'm um, remove all the animals from the entire island. Because of the different zones and the different challenges and with the people on the island and the coves and all the leases and all of that, we had to do a number of different techniques. So there was ground hunting that was both sport hunting and staff hunting, trapping, dogs, aerial hunting. So it was a whole wide variety, but each one of those was a valuable technique that we needed to use to be able to make the program work. The result was 12,000 pigs were removed between 
1990 and 2004. And I think one little thing to remember here is that's a pretty long period of time, so you're actually looking at a lot of reproduction in there too. So shorter periods of time means a more humane way in terms of, of removing less animals. Goat removal was similar. The program started. Most of the animals were removed, but then the program stopped because funding ran out. <laughs> Program started again, a small area, expanded to the whole island. Then it was halted again because some new options came to light. And so the, the program actually did resume, but it was a combination of some live capture and hunting at that point. And finally, it wasn't until 2001 that the last few animals were removed through live capture. And we also collared some of them. And there's a technique that's you know nicknamed the Judas goat because the, you leave a sterilized collared goat on the island that you can track and then let the goat do the work of finding all of his compadres and you know it makes it much easier than you having to track down each individual one. Again, the results here, nine to 10,000 animals removed over a, a decade. So the lessons learned from here were that there are multiple techniques you can use. Sometimes you need to really look at all of them because they're valuable for different challenges. The insurance that the fencing provided, those four zones had a fence in between each one of them. And that really was critical because if you remove the animals from one area, you didn't want it to get repopulated if you got halted either because of lack of funding or for any other reason. So. And then the on-again, off-again programs don't really meet anybody's objectives. And, you know, and in hindsight, if there was an earlier strong commitment of both time and resources to complete the job quickly, it would mean less time for the program, be fewer animals having to be removed because there wouldn't be the reproduction, so more humane in that sense a lower cost, public relations would have been much better because you're dealing with it for a much shorter time. And that's both within internally, like within the Catalina Conservancy and within the general public, particularly the local Avalon community. You know, there was lots of disagreements about what should and shouldn't be done. And so if you can shorten that amount of time, you're in good shape. We also, you know, in hindsight, could have probably done better real-time monitoring and control methods and results, because that would have really shown what was working. And you know, there were some instances where maybe we could have shortened the time that way. One thing we did learn and we were able to pass on was that the work that we did down in Catalina helped when the Santa Cruz Island actually started removing the pigs up here. The opportunities, again, is documenting the recovery of an ecosystem following the removal of a large threat. Oak regeneration, I mean, pigs love acorns. So you, if you planted out acorns, you weren't gonna get very many back until the pigs and the goats were gone. Same with ground nesting birds, you know, they were impacted by them, so their recovery was improved. And then rare plant recovery and reintroductions, again, just because they were able to survive after the animals were removed. So in conclusion, you know, one question would be, what do all these programs have in common? You know, it's four different species, a couple different islands, different challenges, things like that. But I would say, as Kate had mentioned, that you know, it's a group of people that share, share an important collective group of traits that all good teams and all good leaders have that really made this possible. So Dale Hall, who was the director of the US Fish and Wildlife Service for a number of years and CEO of Ducks Unlimited, has outlined a list of these in his recent book that just came out last year, Compelled. And I'd like to just share those with you. You know, if you have a program, you need a vision. You want to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. You're gonna be, it's tough work. You're gonna be working closely with a group of people. They're gonna become like your family. You may spend more time with them than you do with your real family. So you get to know with them and or figure out how to work together. Everybody comes with their own set of skills and knowledge. And so everybody has something they can teach everybody else. And it's important to be able to share that and be willing to share what you know with others. By the same token, nobody knows everything. So you can always learn from somebody else. So be a good listener and be a good learner. Be open to new ideas and be honest. I mean, admit that there are times when you might make a mistake <laughs> and say, well, we made a mistake and let's move on from it and learn from it. But just admit what happens. Integrity is another a key component. It's like a lot of times you could take an easy way to do out to get some of these programs done, but if it's not the right way to do it or the you know, ethical way to do it, you need to put the time and the effort into that. You need to trust your team members and your partners because you're not gonna be able to do everything by yourself, so you know, really work and trust the people you're with. And then, of course, humility. I mean, particularly when you have a program that spans a decade or 15 years, things are gonna happen that you don't expect, and you have to say, okay, let's you know, learn from this and move on. 
And then finally, it's the passion that makes these programs work. It's the passion of the people on these programs. It's the passion of the people in this room that's going to help with future projects. And so when we look at all of the, the, eight, the 16 islands, the eight California islands for Alta California and the eight Baja California islands, it's the passion of everybody that makes the, the future work hopeful. You know, and it's the fact that even though there's been a lot of restoration done out there, there's going to be a lot more to be done. And, and as long as people are willing and able and passionate to do it, you know, I'm really hopeful that we can keep the successes going. So thank you to all the people and organizations and partnerships who made this successful. Couldn't have done it without you, so thanks. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them.